Catfish can be found all over the state of Georgia, and most folks catch them with a pole or a rod and reel. But if you dare, you can give a catfish a chance to bite you back. Find out about hand fishing for catfish, also called grabbling or noodling, coming up on Georgia Outdoors. Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by a grant from Mary Hall Singleton and by the Imlay Foundation. If you grew up in the South and someone took you fishing, you probably encountered a catfish. Catfish are fun to catch, good to eat, and an integral part of Southern culture. With over 48 species, the Ictiluridae catfish family is the largest family of freshwater fishes found in North America. Catfish are easy to recognize. They have no scales, four pairs of barbels or whiskers around the mouth, an adipose fin, stout spines, and are active mainly at night. The flathead and blue catfishes can reach about 132 pounds and are over five feet in length. If 132 pounds sounds large, take a look at one of the catfish cousins from Asia. This record breaker weighs in at 646 pounds and was caught in the Mekong province of Thailand. The largest catfish recorded for Georgia is an 83 pound flathead catfish caught in the Altamaha River in 2005. Whoa. Though pole and line is by far the most common method for catching catfish, there's another option, grablin, also known as noodlin. Both terms describe hand fishing, a method of catching large catfish that dates back to our Native American ancestors. The practice was illegal in Georgia for many years, but a 2005 law recently made noodling legal in our state. Across the state line in Tennessee, the practice has been legal for years. To find out more about the sport, we turn to Tennessee natives Marty and Fostana Jenkins, two veteran grabblers. When the weather gets warm enough, these two take friends and go noodling for flatheads and blue cats on the Tennessee River. In fact, the Jenkins call themselves the Catfish Grabblers. I started grabbling in 1982 with a friend of mine, Robbie Davis. He had heard about catching catfish in holes, you know, in rocks, and, and asked his daddy about it. And his daddy said, yeah, I said, they call it grabbling. Robbie said, hey, you want to try this? I said, yeah, let's go. So I went out, me and him both did, and started running our hands back in holes. Then about what? About seven years ago, yeah. That's started. when uh, me and Faustana started dating, and uh, she started going with me. Faustana, you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> the Jenkins love the sport so much, they make DVDs of everyone they take grabbling. If you're brave enough to take the plunge, a little strategy is useful in getting started. You usually just start out just kind of blocking the hole and guarding to make sure the fish doesn't get out. Are you blocking with your feet? Eventually the fish bite you and you get a fish and then you're hooked. But we joke around and say it was prerequisite for marriage. <laughs> you just try to run your hand up in there and you hope that fish will come up and bite your hand like that. And then you try to grab his lower jaw. Her lower jaw. That's the true art of grabbling. Grabbling is not knowing the fish is in there, running your hand in, and letting them bite you. Running your arm in the hole is really intimidating because, first off, you don't know that there's a fish in there. So you're going with your eyes closed, running your arm up, placing, somewhat <laughs> expecting to get bit, but not knowing for sure that you're going to. And when it does happen, it's just, it's, it's actually scary. One thing, a guy told me, he said, well, one thing about it, if a catfish is in there on bed, they won't let nothing else in that hole. But then somebody said, well, how do you know a catfish is in there in the first place before you run your hand in there? If a catfish is in there, mostly what we do is submerged water. Now, if you start going underneath a lot of these banks with these air pockets, you probably get into more snakes and turtles boat. But for the most part, what we do is submerged water and rocks and all these old boat ramps. And 20-something years I've done it, I've never touched anything but a fish underneath there.
something going on in there. He didn't even feel it. Oh, this big old hole right here. I wonder if somebody's already been here. All these. There should be a fish in. We ain't even hit these holes this year. These holes are cleaned out real good, so they should have been a fish here somewhere. So I'm thinking that somebody's already hit these holes. So now we're gonna go to another place. We've got them all over, up and down, so we're gonna go hit another one. One of the things that we do to make sure, you know, when you're going into an area you've never been, and what we'll do is we'll actually get out of the boat and feel for a hole with our feet, usually first. And so we usually wear shoes because you don't know if somebody's thrown out a glass bottle or something like that, um, or just anything. So we usually wear shoes, um, sandals or tennis shoes or something just to protect your feet. And also, when you find the hole, you stick your feet in there to block it because a lot of times the fish will try to shoot out. We go down and we put our hands in and when the hands come out, the feet go in. So it's kind of nice to have something on your feet in case the fish decides he might want a big toe for supper. <laughs> first hole we hit today, it was a deep hole, probably seven foot deep altogether. We could barely get our toes in the hole and keep our uh, mouth above water. Anytime you go in to a hole, once you make your presence known, you need to keep it covered from there on out, either your hands or your feet. And like right now, it's so deep, I'm trying to keep my toes down in there to keep it covered, because if you go in there and fool with them, they'll shoot out on you. So that's what's the tough on a hole like this. So you gotta try to get them as quick as possible. We've hit this hole one time before last year and it took us quite a while going that deep. And there's several reasons for that. At the very end of that boat ramp on the corner of it is a hole that opens up about three foot wide. And um, it's probably about that high. And that fish, you gotta watch because it has a big area to escape in. And what you want to do is when you first go down, you want to guard the hole all the time. But right now, my toes are barely touching in the bottom of that hole. Yeah. So uh, we'll go down there, and what you do is I'll go in there, that fish is about where Faustana's at, and I'll try to bring it to us, and you just keep your hands sitting there like that. But... Grabbling isn't something you should try alone. Always take a partner. It can be exhausting to hold your breath underwater this many times. This sport takes patience. It's not unusual to spend 20 to 30 minutes luring the catfish out of the nest. And after 25 minutes of trying, Marty and Matthew break the water with a flathead catfish. <laughs> Some call them mud cats or yellow cats, and they've even been called the ugliest catfish. Flatheads are native to the Tennessee River system, and this cat may be older than 20 years. <sighs> oh my gosh! <sighs> Some folks complain that the meat from channel cats gets tough as the fish gets larger, but even larger flatheads are good to eat. The meat is similar to other catfish, but firmer than brim or bass. Last year, there was a 35 pound flathead that we uh, took home, and it was great. We um, seasoned it and uh, deep fried it, and the meat was white, and uh, it was good. There you go. He got a little meat. That's grabbling right there. Look at her teeth. Them teeth on them big old fish. What are called maxillary teeth. They're called inward curving barbs. Now, did you see right there the way that fish twisted and rolled? That's usually what happens is you've got, you've got, um, when you first go in and like, Pulled that fish up there, and thank goodness Matthew was able to come down there and get with me. But um, all I could get to him was two fingers, 
and uh, that's the worst thing that can happen with these big fish because they can break a finger. I've had one broke before. But anyway, right when you grab them, pull, they'll have two hard rolls most of the time. And right when I grabbed a hold of him, he started twisting and rolling. They can take you wrist and just roll it all the way around. If you can stop that when you usually got them, the next time is when you come out of there and usually you break water with them, then you'll have another roll. And uh, so, but that's what it's all about right there. It's crazy, but we have fun doing it. Now it's time to see what this fish weighs. How much was it? 37. All right. We're going, we're going to get this big female at the belly. We're going to get her on back in the water. Sometimes we'll keep fish just like we have for years, you know. Uh, somebody might want one. We might want to keep one. But uh, if we don't, and most of the time these big females, we put them back to um, lay these eggs. And... Um, um, but um, we usually try to take care of them, get them on back in the water. This fish will get a chance to lay her eggs, and Marty, Fastana, and Matthew are off to find more fish. Today is turning out to be a great day to grabble. I guess what I like about grabbling the most is it's just really adrenaline rush somewhat. The biggest thing is, especially when you get a hold of a fairly good sized fish, is trying to hold on to it. It's a fight to hold on to one that weighs 30 pounds. Really, one person cannot hardly handle it. When they're in their own element, they can work you over pretty good. This fish, she was probably eight feet back in the hole underneath the boat ramp. She was hard to get out. Um, she was, you have to actually go back in there and try to feel for their head and pull them to you. And she actually had gotten to where she had her nose facing away from him. The fish will actually do like a big crocodile roll in the water. Um, and sometimes when they roll like that, you gotta either try to put your arm around them or your legs around them or something to stop them from rolling. Or else they're gone in a heartbeat. will get you is that rolling it'll twist your arm or your wrist or your finger so a lot of times you'll see us do it together if you want to make sure you get the fish to shore because you can actually lock them down and keep them from rolling and then you can hold on to them blue cats are the they're the most notorious for being an aggressive fish in the water and they, and they have a little short jaw so I mean they, they have a lot of power and they're hard to hold on to Oh, I'm gonna go back in my hand just to see what I would probably guess 300 people that we've started grappling over the years. Now we'll go like 60 out of 80 days during the summer grappling for catfish. It's not for everybody, but a lot of people just say, well, I'll go watch. And then once they go and they watch and they see what it's like and it's fun, you know, and we catch big fish, then they're like, all right, well, I'll just get in there and I'll try it. And then they usually try it and then, you know, they want to do it again. <laughs> We've taken a bunch of women that enjoy doing it too, and kids. I mean, it's good for everybody. Folks in Tennessee call it grabbling. In other parts of the country, it's called hogging or dogging. But here in Georgia, we prefer the term noodling. Different name and slightly different rules. 
Unlike Tennessee and some other states, in Georgia you can only use your hands. Reggie Weaver of Georgia's Department of Natural Resources took us noodling on Lake Lanier. There's some folks that have done this probably more in the middle and south Georgia in the rivers uh, for good numbers of years. But noodling basically to find is actually trying to catch uh, catfish species with your hands. And when this occurs is in uh, springtime when catfish spawn. They stay in these areas for maybe up to a month to six weeks, so they're readily accessible to anglers who want to try the art of noodling. Most of the time in, in our populations, an average catfish can be two or three pounds, but they can get fairly large. 25 or 30 pounds is not uncommon to extract from some of these hoses. Chris, uh, you know, we're talking about noodling, and I did this many years ago when I was growing up in Tennessee, so I uh, thought you might be interested in trying it. You have never done this before, I've never have done you? it, no. Well, Chris, now the lake's way down. You know, we're almost in a mini drought again, and it's late June, uh, so a lot of the catfish have already spawned, but uh, hopefully we can still find a few. All of our reservoirs and rivers have uh, good, healthy catfish populations. Channel catfish, flathead catfish, and blue catfish, not all three are found everywhere, but there are good populations, so noodling can be in your local reservoir, a major reservoir on a stream bank on, on a small river. So just finding the right habitat, the spawning habitat, is probably the key to be successful at noodling. It's a little cool. Yeah, it is. I don't think it's 82. Try to find out all the places are real good. Sometimes the bigger rocks will have a better cavern back under them. And for catfish, 70 to 75 degree water is a temperature range uh, that they spawn. Now, in South Georgia, you may get these water temperatures early May to sometime in North Georgia where it's a little cooler, higher elevation. Uh, noodling may be good into the middle of June. No fish in that hole. <laughs> Chris, yeah, we kind of run out of big rocks here, so that's what we need. There's not much place for the catfish to hide. So I think we'll go over here and try another little section on the other side. In Georgia, uh, the only way it's legal to noodle is with your hands. You cannot use any uh, accessory devices or anything like a snare, a dip net, scuba equipment's not legal. We feel like that with the hands only, uh, you know, you're giving the catfish its benefit of the doubt of maybe escaping. Yeah, Chris, if, you know, sometimes it's kind of spooky when you reach under there and one grabs your hand. I just, I just think the whole thing is intimidating because you're pulling out fishing line and, you know, you mm -hmm. see some broken bottles around and stuff like that. Uh, That's, uh, it's, yeah. I don't it's, think it will be little, for everyone. It won't be, no. Just for, uh, a few brave at heart. <laughs> a few things you can do to be safety in that respect is wear long pants, something like blue jeans, a long shirt that will keep your arms covered, and gloves. But you can see too with all this fish and line and hook and bottles that, uh, you know, it'd be, be nice as folks would take their empty containers home and not throw things in the water because it's not good for the environment, for the fish. Or for noodlers. Yeah, or for <laughs> noodlers particularly. The only fish we really got in contact with there was a little small bluegill, but that was exciting enough that I wanted to keep going after we were kind of already getting a little bit tired. And uh, it's, it's fun. It's the uh, the closest thing to a contact fishing, I would I would say that there is. I'm kind of you know banged up a little bit from sliding around on the rocks and stuff. It was fun. Well, no luck today, but Reggie just might talk Chris into another try when the water level and temperature cooperate. He won't let go of my hands! <laughs> Noodling isn't for everyone, but for the most daring, it can provide an exciting, hands-on fishing experience. Those who love it can't get enough, as anyone who's ever wrestled a 40-pound flathead into shore can attest. There's truly nothing like it. <laughs> If sporting tackle is the way you prefer to fish, consider entering a fish in the Georgia Angler Award Program. 
all game fish and some other species are eligible for angler awards and freshwater fish state records. And you can win even if you aren't a resident of Georgia. Anglers need an application and a clear sideways photo of the fish. Witnesses are needed unless the fish is weighed at a Georgia Wildlife Resources Division office. Applications must be received no later than January 15th of the year following the catch. Fish must be caught in Georgia during the legal angling season for the species taken in accordance with all fishing laws and regulations. Fish must be caught on sporting tackle and be hooked and landed by the entrant. For more rules and information, visit this website. In Georgia, there is no limit to the amount of flathead catfish you can take home. This is because flatheads are not native to many of our waterways. At some point after the 1970s, flathead catfish were introduced by well-meaning anglers to some of the rivers in Georgia. Once they arrived in the Satilla River in the mid-1990s, flatheads began drastically reducing the numbers of red-breast sunfish and bull catfish. Georgia's Department of Natural Resources is trying to help. Flathead catfish are an exotic species to the Satilla River. They were introduced in, in the mid-90s, around 1996 was when we confirmed the presence of flatheads in the river. Since then, DNR initiated a program to remove the flatheads to hopefully limit the impact of the native fish. The units we're using today, it's an electrofishing unit. It's specifically designed for catfish. It's a low frequency electrofishing unit and it puts out a, approximately 15 to 18 pulses per second. If you've ever been shocked as far as by 110, it kind of feels like it, it grabs you, but it doesn't really hurt you real bad. This electrofishing equipment seems to affect the various catfish species differently. The flatheads are hit the hardest and it, they generally just kind of float to the surface and, and are temporarily stunned for a little while. That allows us to net them and put them in a live well such as this and then we can aerate them and hold them in that tank until we're ready to work the fish up. And the channel cats and, and whites, it, it doesn't seem to hit them quite as hard and they tend to just kind of scoot around on the surface. After the flatheads are caught, they are weighed and measured. If local charity food banks have the facilities to process the meat, the fish are sent there. If not, the fish are often marked and released for tracking their population. We've had limited success. This is a, the lower section of the river. Unfortunately, in this section of the river, the flathead catfish have expanded to a, extremely large numbers and have had a, a pretty noticeable impact on the native species in this section of the river. The primary species impacted by the flathead catfish in the Satilla River is the red breast sunfish. Uh, red breast sunfish are in the same family as the bluegill or the brim, your typical sunfish. The males especially have a real bright red breast on them, and that's where they get their name from. The locals call them rooster reds. And not only have the red breast sunfish been impacted to quite an extent, the bullhead catfish have also, this is your butter cats, speckled cats, and stuff like that as they're known by locals. In the section of the river below Highway 82, their numbers have gone down drastically as well as the red breast sunfish. And we've also noticed a, a pretty precipitous drop decline in the population numbers of the, of the white catfish and channel catfish in this area of the river also. That's a white cat. You can see he's got a slightly forked tail, a rounded head. We believe the flatheads were introduced into the Satilla River by some well-meaning anglers. At the time, we were doing a population study on the Altamaha River where we were fin clipping and tagging fish. When we first started removing fish from the Satilla River, we found fish that were marked in the Altamaha in the Satilla River. The biggest clue is that anglers were moving them over, and also the, the fish didn't start down at the mouth of the river and work their way up. They were found at a location in the center of the river and had expanded out from there. If they had naturally colonized from the Altamaha, they would have had to swim through the intercoastal water to to the mouth of the river, and they didn't do that in this case. Through sampling of the sunfish species, DNR has found a 75% drop in the number of red breast sunfish in sections of the Satilla River. They have found a similar decrease of the bullhead, white, and channel catfish population. At the same time, flatheads have increased dramatically. And we believe it's a direct correlation why these other species have dis disappeared due to predation. 
There is a message here for all anglers. Do not move fish from one water body to the other because there, there can be a real negative impacts to the native fishing within that new system that you're stocking those fish. Most of the anglers that you would, will run into on the Satilla River are, are real upset that flatheads have gotten into this system and are having a, a major impact on their native fish, especially the red breast sunfish. This is probably the, was Georgia's premier and probably still is Georgia's premier red breast river. The problem of native species being affected by non-native invasive species will not easily be solved. It will take everyone's cooperation to ensure it doesn't happen with other fish species. Never release pets into the wild, and when fishing, do not release unused bait fish into the water. Whether you choose to angle by line or by hand, Georgia is a great place to fish. When fishing, make sure you have a license, be safe, and have a great time reeling or wrestling your catch. <laughs> <laughs> Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by a grant from Mary Hall Singleton and by the Imlay Foundation.